BYU quarterback middleman John Beck is on BYU Sports Nation. Uh, did, middleman. Middleman now. Did, <laughs> that's a new one. Did, but I'll did take wanna... it, but I'll take it. <laughs>This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. To preview the matchup, no one better to talk to than our frenemy, Alex Jensen, the play-by-play voice of the St. Mary's Gales. Alex, welcome to the program. We hope not for the final time, but maybe. It's good to see you guys. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think that this is going to be the last WCC matchup between these two teams at the Marriott Center. There's so much history. I'm sure we'll get into it. But uh, I'm glad to be on. I'm excited to be in Provo. If this last game could be as good as your first game here at the Marriott Center, then Saturday night's going to be one for the ages. What do you remember from that? No question. Uh, yeah, my first game in the Marriott Center was the Dell of a Dagger. And uh, we were just talking about it. that call is gone, man. I have no idea where that call I mean, It certainly wasn't recorded. Uh, but this has been a great rivalry, you know, and it kind of it, it didn't start there. I remember the year before there was a really heated game between St. Mary's and BYU at the Marriott Center. Uh, that the Gales won, and the next year was the Dell of a Dagger. Uh, so, yeah, it was. I, I remember the environment, um, just you know, the first time really being in an environment where there's that many people, um, and you know, that much passion for their team, which is what I appreciate so much about the the BYU fan base. But yeah, just that play was. I mean, you guys saw it was it was insane. I, I had a front row seat. I was right there. He took off right in front of me, and to hear to you know to go from Tyler Hawes's shot in the middle of the key. To, to that was was crazy. I've been hooked ever since, man, on this on this rivalry. I've been putting together the uh, you know pregame show with our producer Hema Hamuli for tomorrow night uh, ahead of the contest on ESPN two and BYU Radio, and I've chosen not to include that for obvious reasons. Uh, but when you talk about this rivalry, because when BYU entered the league, we we had certainly circled okay Gonzaga, St. Mary's was in there, but I don't think we expected this to become what it's become. Why is BYU and St. Mary's what it is, in your opinion? Well, I think both teams have kind of, you know, helped taken each other to the next level. I know that's certainly the case with, with BYU as far as it concerns St. Mary's. You know, BYU has helped elevate uh, the Gales program. But these two teams have been fighting for the same spot, you know, for the greater portion of 11, 12 years, however long BYU has been in the league. And, you know, you throw in moments like the Dell of a Dagger. I heard your... Uh, interview with Eric Mika uh, yesterday or a couple days ago, Jerem, and the and the choke sign in Moraga. I mean, you know, this is a rivalry that's only going to last in WCC play for, you know, a dozen years or so, but it has really burned hot with moments like that, moments like the Eric Mika, um, you know, choke sign in Moraga and some of the vitriol that's gone back and forth between both fan bases and both teams. You know, really in 2000, Jack Landale's senior year, BYU in the in the WCC tournament kept the Gales out of out of the uh, NCAA tournament. I mean that was a team that I think should have made it anyway. Of course, you know and there's no reason to go down that rabbit hole. But I'm going to miss it, man. I'm really going to miss BYU in the league. I think everybody is. I think everybody knew that this was you know that this was coming at some point. Um, but I think it's been a it's been a relationship for as heated as as it's been between BYU and St. Mary's. It's been something that has certainly you know, helped elevate the Gales program and given them a little bit more notoriety nationwide. One thing that has been fun to watch in Marriott Center games is there's the game and then there's the other game, the relationship between Randy Bennett and The Rock, BYU student section. <laughs> Why is that so uh, so unique? I, can't, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I, you know, from my experience with Randy Bennett, he is a thousand percent locked in on what's going on on the floor. And if, you know, there are any, you know, if, if the rock feels like he's doing anything in their direction, I can almost promise you that it is not on purpose because his mind is a thousand percent on what's going on on the floor. And that's, what's made him such a good coach. You know, he's two wins away guys from, from 500, by the way, I do want to note that, uh, you know, if, if the Gales, he's going to get there this year and that's just an incredible accomplishment for somebody who went, uh, who took over a team that was two and twenty-seven at St. Mary's College? You know their gym at that time looked a lot more like Pepperdine's with the you know the wooden bleachers. Uh, but in, as far as the relationship with the Rock, you know I, I don't really get a chance to to notice that. 
But, uh, you know, I, I think that any interaction that's happening there is probably from Randy Bennett's perspective, a total accident. Maybe a little maybe there's a little bit because, you know, I mean, the Gales or the visiting team walks into their locker room right under the student section. Right. So you can't help but get a little up close and personal. But, you know, I can tell you from my experience that Randy Bennett is 100 percent locked in on what's going on on the floor. What do we need to do? Uh, on this next possession, how do we need to execute our scout? That's what's going through his mind. Maybe afterwards there might be a little bit of chirping. I haven't seen it personally, <laughs> um, but it, 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 you know, as well as I know Randy Bennett, I, I can tell you exactly that. That's what's going through his mind. I think there's a little bit. The there, there's a little bit in there because a lot of coaches <laughs> come in here, but the Rock knows when Randy Bennett comes out, and uh, it makes it, it it makes it fun. I was at a weird game. <laughs> well, uh, was Jer- it last year yes. in Utah State? I was doing stats yes. CBS Sports Network. And I go up there, and Randy I've has this weird like interaction uh, with Utah State, storms off, kind of waves to the crowd, and then is out. And I was like, vintage Randy Bennett. <laughs> it was awesome. I, you know what? From my perspective, I saw him walking off the floor, you know, raising the fist Oh, yeah, the fist air. bump. It, it was, I mean, the whole interaction was, was strange between, uh, you know, he and the Utah State staff. There was some stuff going on back and forth over the last couple of minutes. Uh, I don't know what all that was about, but his reaction was priceless. It was like BYU watching two ex-girlfriends fight. It was just like, I don't know why, but it was really (laughs) enjoyable to see. Let's talk about this St. Mary's team because this, I mean, metrically, this is the best St. Mary's team ever. Uh, Seventh in Ken Palm, sixth in defensive efficiency, 35th in offensive efficiency. Watched a couple games, obviously, prepped for this game. I'm really impressed by what St. Mary's is. It's hard for me to think, hey, this is better than some of those Landale, uh, Della Vadova, the Sweet 16 team a while back. To, but, hey, uh, on paper, this could be the greatest St. Mary's team ever. So what is going so well right now? Well, you know, I think when you compare this team right now to the beginning of the season, and a lot of people forget that with the return of Logan Johnson using his COVID year and Alex Dugas and Kyle Bowen coming back, other than that, this team was pretty young. You know, Aiden Mahaney's a true freshman. Mitchell Saxon's starting for the first time. Augustus Marshallona started about 13 games a year ago, but was in and out of the rotation, really. Um, you know, Lemon Bockler uh, decided to head back to Estonia and play professionally over there. So you, there's not a whole lot of experience here. So I think what we've seen over the last few weeks is, you know, these guys are starting, you know, Aiden Mahaney is starting to understand the offense. Guys are understanding their roles. They're getting comfortable with their roles. And you mentioned the defensive numbers, you know, I mean, Randy Bennett, uh, you know, told Steve Croner after the, the Santa Clara game, and I, you know, I can see it with my eyes, this team doesn't have a bad defender. And, you know, going back to that 2020 year, that COVID year, um, you know, this team really adopted a, a gritty mindset. In fact, their, their team motto a year ago, and they've kind of carried on to this year, was gritty, not pretty. And for the uh, <laughs> for the NCAA selection show, they made T-shirts pretty not pretty. It was pretty cool. Uh, but when you combine that mindset with, you know, what has become a really good offensive team. And as I mentioned, guys figuring their roles out. Aiden Mahaney has been is, is dynamic. You know, I kind of compare him to an Alex Barcelo type, uh, maybe a little bit different. But, you know, you can compare him to a bunch of different guards throughout the West Coast Conference. But when you combine those two things, the attention to detail, the individual talent, um, and the cohesion, this team's connected, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot like last year where it's a connected club. Everybody kind of buys into the culture. Uh, they've got maybe a little bit more talent than they had, uh, a year ago at, at some, some certain spots. It's, it's been a lot of fun to watch, but again, I think, you know, over the last few weeks, uh, the biggest difference has been, and since that three game losing streak in particular, uh, at the end of November and beginning of December, you know, that these guys are really figuring out where they fit in, figuring out their roles and understanding, you know, what is being asked of them. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. What's Trending is presented by Tim Daly Ford, part of the Tim Daly Auto Group, serving Utah since 1968. The NFL draft more than three months out, but Senior Bowl coming up, NFL PA Bowl this week. There's a lot of combo uh, around the draft right now, especially because, as you mentioned, Shep, Mel Kuyper of ESPN just releases updated player rankings. Jaron Hall sixth among quarterbacks, Blake Freeland fifth among offensive tackles. So I ask you, do you think both will be off the board by the fourth round of the draft? 
Um, there is certainly a chance. I will say it's probably likely that at least one is. And if I have to pick which one right now, I would probably say the more likely to be off the board through three rounds is Blake Freeland. No question. Um, I, I think that's probably where that plays out. Uh, honestly, I think a guy like Blake Freeland could go as high as the second round. I think the third round is probably the sweet spot for him, but I, I certainly could see him going in the second round. And look, it, it's, it's certainly not anything negative against Jaron Hall. We know how good Jaron Hall is. I think Jaron Hall is going to be a fantastic quarterback at the next level. I, I certainly think there is a chance that he could be like a round three guy. I think probably round four is is probably more realistic for for him. And and it's not because of a talent issue. I think once when you look at the NFL draft, and I am an NFL draft nut, I love it. The NFL draft is one of those ones from a quarterback standpoint, once you have the top tier guys, so your CJ Strouds, Bryce Youngs, once those go off, especially yeah. with what we've Will seen. Yeah, yeah, with what we've seen in the last couple of years with a lot of success from middle round and late round quarterbacks actually coming in and having success in the NFL, I, I think I think teams are willing to sort of push the quarterback down the road a little bit, and they feel like they can still get really good talent in the fourth and the fifth rounds because it, it's proven to be. No. If you're a, certainly a tackle, and we know that at BYU, um, Blake was a left tackle, such a hot yep. commodity yep. in the NFL. If you're anywhere close to being a top ten tackle, certainly a left tackle, they're going to snatch you up as quick as they possibly can. That's why I think it's probably more likely that Blake is taken before round three if I have to pick between the two. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, very likely that uh, Blake will be the first off the board from BYU and in the first three rounds. Probably, I, I'm guessing second round, but um, you know, Kuyper very high on both, uh, Jaron and, and Blake. Dane Brugler of The Athletic has Jaron as the 13th best quarterback, Blake as the 14th best. Kuiper is kind of the main voice in this conversation. That's quite the difference, too. But there's a big difference there. If that's the case, yeah, you're not going for a while. You might be third, fourth, fifth round. I don't think Blake falls to the fifth, but Blake feels like he's top three rounds almost for sure. Um, being that good at that position, like you mentioned. And yeah, to, certain, certain teams are going to be so desperate, they're going to grab their quarterback in the first yeah. five picks. The Bears don't need one. Texans need one. Arizona doesn't need one, but kind of. Uh, Colts definitely need one. Seahawks might not need one in the top five if they re-sign Geno. I'm hoping the Seahawks grab Jaron, honestly. In like the Geno and fourth. Drew Locke, what are you talking about? You're set. <laughs> Drew Locke, <laughs> nice. Um, okay, so NFL mock draft database. They compile like 543 mock drafts, which is what we've asked all of our uh, students to do behind the scenes in research. They said, hey, wait, there's just a website. We're like, okay, cool. Jaron Hall projected to go in the third round. Um, overall, 82nd, uh, Blake Freeland, third round, 78. So they, they actually have Blake just barely ahead of Jaron there, right? Highest pick, okay? Uh, you see 56th for Jaron, 69th for Blake Freeland. Let's bring Puka Nakua into this conversation. Um, going to be uh, another guy that's kind of the th- – he's the third best prospect from BYU, clearly. And he's a guy that could be drafted. Um, I could also see him perhaps not being drafted, but I think he'll crush it at the combine. Yes, I do too. And they'll see the film and they'll go, playmaker. Because when I assess a football team, I go, how many playmakers do you have? Are you in that upper echelon of talent and ability to change a game? And Puka is certainly that. We saw it firsthand on the first play from scrimmage yeah. in South Florida. It was amazing. And Cam Meller is a guy that uh, assesses college football. He's been assessing pro football for uh, many years. Homie of the program, as they called him. He came on recently and said that he thinks Puka might go before Jaron. Listen to this. I think he might eventually, as we get through January into March, and when he gets to run at the Combine, he's going to be a guy who could be drafted higher than Jared. And I just think that his pre-draft process, from the Senior Bowl all the way through to a Pro Day to the Combine, uh, he's going to be a guy that turns heads and people are going to have the, the, the develop their draft crushes on. So I think Nakua, who could jump up and maybe right there ahead of Jared, depending on how they both perform at the Senior Bowl. Turning heads is uh, aptly named because that's what the cornerbacks are doing as they watched Puka run down the field. It, this is exciting to have three guys really in the mix, yeah. two that we feel are, are going to be drafted for sure, and a quarterback because the moment Jaron's drafted, Aaron Roderick just adds that LinkedIn, goes, yep, another guy, yeah. come here. Keaton, you're going to be the next guy. Let's go. 
if you're certainly if you're not a first day guy, so you're talking first round and you're not a second day guy, which is rounds two and three. If you're rounds four through seven, look, I, I understand that there is a financial aspect of where you're drafted in a certain area and kind of a slotted money allowance, that type of stuff. So I get you want to be drafted as high as you possibly can, because then that means financially you're able to make more money in terms of signing bonuses and things like that. But I think if you're looking at day three, so in a situation where Puka, by a lot of the you know, yeah. measurables, that's where that looks like he would probably go. Day three guy. Possibly Jaron Hall being that day three guy. Again, I would expect him, if it is day three, Early, early day yeah. three. But if you're four through seven, to me, it's more about going to a place where you can be a fit than being a high pick. Zach, some, Wilson. Zach Wilson! Well, it's hey, the perfect situation well, there, is he not? Tyler Algier is the perfect scenario for Fifth this. Fifth round. Fifth we round. We did not think he'd slide that yes, far. But he went to a perfect situation. They needed a running back. He was able to get in and get significant playing time, and we already saw what he was able to do getting over 1,000 yards on the ground. So if you're a day three, I, I know you want to go as high as you possibly can, but it's so much more about fit rounds four through seven than it is about being a yes. high pick. Yes. Go where you have a realistic chance to make a difference and they're going to give you playing time. I think that's, I think that's pivotal. Yes, Brady Christensen has been with the Panthers team. It's not been super competitive the last two years, but they're building, right? They've fired the head coach. They're going to give it. He's been able to start at left guard last year as the guy. And in the NFL, more than any other league, teams go from worst to first quickly. Yeah. We've seen the last couple of years. Like, the Bengals the are Bengals. super legit. They yeah. used to be terrible. The Browns were terrible They went forever. from two wins to being Super Bowl contenders. Crazy, right? Yeah. And they could win it this year. Like, in the... Mm, no, <laughs> they don't, but that's fine. <laughs> He's like... Go Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> Not a neutral side game. Um, and, and you have these teams, like even the Browns, right? Won a playoff game two years ago on right. the road at Pittsburgh after being terrible for years. Lions. Nearly made it this year, but thankfully the Detroit Sea Lions were awesome on the final day of the regular season. Shout out to the Lions and Jamal Williams for helping a brother out. But this, this is going to be interesting to see where they go. Teams that need quarterbacks in the NFL, uh, where Jaron Hall could go, by the way. We can trim this down to like 13 or something. Panthers, Lions, Texans, Colts, Raiders, Rams, Saints. Probably not Giants. They'll probably resign Daniel Jones after this year. We'll see. Jets. Seahawks need a backup. Uh, Bucks, Titans, Commanders. I okay, think are teams looking at Jaron though to come in and be their starter? No, or are they looking at? So, I think he's back a backup initially. So is that, yeah, I which think is exciting because he's going to get the experience that we wish Zach Wilson had. Correct. Got. Now Zach's the second pick. You're expected to be a starter. You're expected to contribute. You're expecting your first two years to take those leaps, like we saw with some guys like Trevor Lawrence. Unfortunately, and I said this when he was drafted, I hope Zach can overcome Jets. Some, obviously, Zach uh, and the Jets are contributors to what's happened here. But we can't always just blame every team but Jimmer. Does that make sense? Like, sometimes Jimmer maybe wasn't good enough. And uh, we love Jimmer. Uh, but it's like, oh, the Kings. You're on, like, five teams. We love Jimmer. The but Kings like, were the absolute worst place for him to start his career out. Right, but he went other places. Yes. Still didn't work out. Like, at what point do you look in the mirror, right? And, and, and Zach uh, Wilson is looking in the mirror right now. And hopefully they find an offensive coordinator that can b- get the best out of him or go somewhere else. But the, u- the, the timeline in the universe changed when he went to the Jets and not the next pick. Right. To the Niners. The Niners would have been a match made in heaven. That day on Pro Day, they traded up to three. That day, John Lynch, the GM, walks into the indoor practice facility and they want Zach Wilson. They wanted to get up to two so that they could <sighs> take him. Kyle but the Sh- Jets were not going to let it happen. Kyle Shanahan could have done with Zach Wilson what he has done with Brock Purdy. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Good World Brand is presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Aaron Rodgers made his weekly appearance on the Pat McAfee Show yesterday, and the topic of Zach Wilson came up. Here's some of what Rodgers had to say about the former Cougar. For him, it's just going to be, you know, humility, clean, lean into that, and then just consistently you know, working on the fundamentals. I think, I think he, he's so talented, but but the best, the best in the business, can make all the plays outside the pocket, can move around, but fundamentally inside the pocket, like. 
you know, especially the two guys on the FC side. You got guys who can really uh, play in the pocket and then also extend and make plays outside the pocket. But inside the pocket, that's where you beat teams. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, that whoever they decide to, to go with uh, at coordinator can come in and, and, uh, and work with him and, and uh, kind of break down a lot of the fundamentals uh, for him and, and uh, get him playing on time because I think he's talented enough to have a long career in the league. In Zach Wilson, is it Aaron Rodgers or is it the New York Jets? More faith. Uh, feels like Aaron Rodgers <laughs> yeah. at this point. With some insight there. And Zach, uh, you know, has been a fan of Aaron for a long time. Jets say they have faith in him. and he's still, I don't necessarily believe them. I believe they will sign a vet that Zach can sit behind and learn a little bit this year. But uh, we'll see what kind of vet they get. Like, like if Aaron Rodgers was like, oh, I need to leave the Packers. I, honestly, the Jets are a good quarterback away from being pretty interesting there in the playoffs. It they were 6-3. It would be kind of interesting if he ends up going to the Jets and Zach can learn from Aaron Rodgers. I mean, I know that's certainly out there. That, 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 I think that'd be pretty interesting. Look, I, I think right now the answer is, is Aaron Rodgers. And one, because the Jets aren't saying a ton other than we still have faith in him. You know, it's very Their actions robotic. will show that. Look, here, here's what I know. In a game that meant absolutely nothing, and you could have put Zach Wilson in as a starting quarterback to end the regular season, you started Joe Flacco. That's for what no I, for reason. For no reason. There's yeah. no you reason to start Joe Flacco in Joe. that game. Yeah, that was weird. So that that's what I know about I, that situation. I was very concerned uh, when they, yeah, were, were not even rostering him. For yes. Games. Yep. It's like, what? BYU sent homie of the program, Cam Miller, as mentioned earlier for College Football Network, posted the following this yesterday. Awesome. This photo is art. It's Cosmo doing a flip during a game in front of the rock, and he's just like 25 feet in the air. <laughs> Cam is correct. This is art. What do we call this masterpiece? I have two options. Okay. I'm going to start out with what I think is the best of the two. Cosmo and the Cosmos. Oh, Okay. pretty good. And then my other one, Cougars in Flight. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Those are my two. Um, one option is Cougar Tail. <laughs> Another is Cosmo Funke. If you're in the rest of the development fan. Sea of blue or blueness. Okay. There you go. Not bad, not bad. Put it in the MOA. Okay. Uh, Pope Shinari was back. Taking last, the country by storm. It is taking. Uh, there's a board game version that's coming out very, very soon. Uh, very nice. Yes, you can get it at the BYU store. You can get, get it with more Monopoly You cannot. Well. I'm not. Do not go to the BYU store asking for Pope Shinari. Here's what's up. Why are you saying not, that? It is not a thing. I just made that up. Uh, it was back last night on BYU Basketball with Mark Pope. Last time, it was a tiki who drew this picture of Coach Pope. So there, see, there's there's one on on the the left of your screen. Uh, then last night, Richie Saunders drew this one of Greg <laughs> Rubel. So I ask you, who did it better? First off, I'm not going to make fun of anyone's art because I am terrible. That's better than drawing. anything I could okay. do. I yeah, I, I can't even do this. I mean, um, but yeah, both of these are terrible. <laughs> what I find interesting is the one that was was made of Coach Pope, I think actually looks more like Greg, and the one of Greg looks more like Coach Pope. Oh, you want to reverse flow I think that? you could reverse it. Listen, yeah. there's a lot of pressure in that moment to, uh, to draw on national TV. <laughs> it's so. like doing math and drawing, things you don't do fun, on live TV. Fun fact about Spencer, like really, really good at just random math. Yes, if he is. If you were like, hey, 89 divided by 13 or something, he would like do it pretty close to yes. within it, if not spot on. Where I'd be like, I don't know on that one. I have no clue. I, I would have this look of terror on my face. Be like, is it six something? Yeah. Seven? I don't know. I don't I'd know. be like, fun fact, didn't take five? a math class at BYU. Didn't take one. There you go. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Well, Eric Mika has been globe trotting for a while now to leaving BYU following his sophomore season. It's taken him all over the globe, including su suiting up for Team USA. And it's St. Mary's week, so we've got to talk about the Gales with him and much more. Here's the new Mr. Triple Double. What's up, Eric Mika? It's been a minute. I feel like I see you uh, once a summer. I go watch Open Gym. Uh, it's it's you and Yoli and and uh, TJ and the guys, and then it's the, the old crew. Current crew. Yeah, it's that's always fun to watch. Uh, but How's how's the G League, man? Uh, you're hanging out in Henderson. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you, you're getting a triple double, stepping on Kyle Collins with turf here. Uh, yeah, was, how's it going, was, man? With with all these uh, 
People call me Mr. Triple Double. I was thinking Kyle might um, take offense <laughs> to that. Consider he probably, since I got one, what, three days ago, he's probably already gotten another one in Japan. Yeah, I think he just got one as we were speaking. Yeah, right like right now, I'm watching. No, he, he gets them all the time, so I can't quite take over that name. Um, but, yeah, Henderson's been awesome. We love living here. The team's been a lot of fun. You know, it's such a unique dynamic being on this Ignite team, you know, way different experience from the last time I was in the G League. Um, but super enjoyable. It's been a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, we're loving it down here. So walk us through um, how you kind of got to this G League. Because two years in Italy, Germany, G League, China, Spell with the Kings, Serbia, France. You've been all over, man. Mm-hmm. And then you ultimately yeah. come back to the G League. And this is the most unique G League team that that exists, it seems like. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's a testament to relationships in basketball and, and the people that you know, um, and, and timing, because last year we tried to make this work, but it, it, it didn't work. You know, we signed with a French team, um, I think a week before we would have signed with this team. Um, but we're happy that we came this year because it's, it's in Vegas, which is so close to our home. Um, versus last year's in Walnut Creek, which was a little, you know, so just a little bit farther. Um, but yeah, it, the the GM of this team was an assistant GM for the Kings um, when I was in Sacramento, and and the head the head GM for the Stockton Kings. And so, you know, we his name is Anthony McClish, and we stayed in touch, and um, you know, we're really good friends. And so, when he sort of took over this thing as the GM this this last year. Um, you know, he threw it out there for me. And after two years of, I've mostly been injured. Um, you know, last year in France, I had, I had a wrist surgery. And so I was out from November to the rest of the season. The year before that in Belgrade, I was out with COVID for almost two months. And then I broke my right elbow, you know, so I've just been battling all these injuries, you know, great spots, great teams, you know, um, and, and it's been a lot of fun, but when you're hurt, it, it just, it just sucks, you know, being so far away. And so, you know, just wanting to be back home a little bit closer with our son, um, you know, getting more games under my belt in one season, uh, cause the G league, you know, they play 50 games. Uh, it, it, it just kind of made sense. And it's been a lot of fun. Talking to Eric Mika on BYU sports nation, you get to play in some cool situations. Obviously this mm-hmm. team is, is built to like, cater to get guys to the next to the NBA draft and to so you playing with Scoot Henderson what's that like and then you played against Victor Wembanyama what was that like yeah. yeah both uh both very cool situations you know um playing against Victor was was uh was cool cuz you heard so much about him uh start, you know going back to last year um I played against him in France as well uh, and then even seeing his growth from last season to this season was cool he's he's definitely gotten better and what I liked about him was he played in both games. And what I mean by that is he played really well in the first game. I, I don't remember his stat line, but he, you know, he crushed it. He showed everyone that he's a, he's a real number one, um, you know, pick potential pick. Like he, ha- he has that, um, you know, ability to be, to go number one and not, you know, be some fluke, but then he played in the second one. Cause he was, he was mad that he lost. And, you know, despite his agent and, his team and I'm sure his, his counsel telling him, Hey, you shouldn't play really even this season, you know, you've shown what you need to show, you know, he wanted to play cause he lost like he, he's a gamer, you know, he likes to play um, and he's not going to sit out to protect his draft stock or anything like that. And I really like that about him. And that's, you know, same goes for Scoot. He's the same way. Like he, uh, after his big games, he could have sat out. After his um, start to the season, he could have sat out. Um, you know, he got a concussion. He was out for a couple of weeks, but he was he just wanted to be back on the court. Like, he loves playing. Um, he's a super, super good kid that works harder than anybody on the team, you know, and, and he's the second youngest on the team. So, um, you know, it, it's been a lot of fun playing with him. I'm really excited to see where he ends up. Um, you know, at one or two, you know, depending on what, what teams need, you know, they're very different players. So, um, you know, there's this consensus that it'll be when, when Benyama, which it very might well be, but, you know, Scoot, 
as a lot of people will say, would be number one in a lot of other draft classes. Like he, he's the real deal. And I think he's going to be in the league for a long time. You're at the point of your career where they're kids now. Yeah. They're kids. <laughs> You're getting old. We, man. Have, we, have, we have one guy who he's supposed to be a senior in high school. He's turned 18. That's a, that's a kid. Season. That's a kid. Yeah. That's a kid. Um, but that's what makes, you know, I tell everyone that's what makes Ignite so fun is you have at the beginning of the season, you have a 17 year old and you have a 39 year old all on the team and, and everything else in between. So, you know, a lot of different levels of experience. Um, you know, you have guys that are super, super raw and young in the world of basketball. And then you have guys that are really experienced that have played all over the place and made a name for themselves. So being right there in the middle for me has been a lot of fun. You still hoping to make the NBA again? Yeah, I mean, that that is part of the reason of trying to be here is it's a really good platform to to get a call up. Um, you know, call ups happen every year in the G League and being on a team without any affiliation, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like you can be picked off by anybody. Um, so, yeah, it's a hope. I wouldn't say it's like the primary goal of coming to this team just because you just can't rely on on call ups there, you know far and in between and it's right time, right place. You know, there it, it's you know, okay. What team has a big that has a super similar skill set to mine go down, you know, get, gets hurt, gets cut, gets COVID, whatever it is. Um, you know, you're really kind of just waiting um, to see what happens. But uh, like I said, couldn't be a better spot to, to be waiting in. And you played uh, with Team USA, which is cool. Is that going to happen some more? It was awesome to follow you. Uh, get to play in, what, Puerto Rico on the 4th of July or something? Right? Yep. Yeah, we were in Puerto Rico, Cuba, um, I mean, Vegas, and then Colombia this last summer. Um, so they actually they did invite me to come back and play in this last window for the World Cup in February. But we... I say we because me and my teammate John Jenkins, who was also on Team USA um, and is on my team with, with Ignite, we, we decided that we're not going to do it this time. Just the logistics of, of this trip are insane. They're going to um, – they're doing like a training camp in Houston and then overnighting down to Uruguay, playing against Uruguay, and then they're going to overnight down to Brazil. And so just doing that with a training camp all in the middle of the season was just a lot, so we ended up um, – deciding not to do it. Uh, but, but it was a tough decision because as, as hard as it would have been in those 12 days, it would have been a lot of fun. It's, it's really awesome playing for them. You're not an Amazon package. So this is not, this is not going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's quite the trip. That would be eventful and uh, extremely tiring. I saw yeah. in a video that the G League released that your hidden talent is now ceramics. You've taken some classes. We making some pottery dog. Now, like I said in the video, <laughs> not my hidden talent yet you're working but, I hope, but i'm working on it yeah it, it, like I, I i've taken a couple of classes i have a lot of fun doing it i'm horrible at it it's not easy um but i i would really like that to be my hidden talent so mm. i guess that tells you where i'm at as far as hidden talents because yeah. i'm hoping for one i don't even have one <laughs> it won't be hidden though because i just brought it up uh it'll, it'll just be a talent yeah they just put it out there for the whole world to see <laughs> Um, you know, it'd be awesome. Yeah, I said, I mean, though. Just, just having a little creative outlet is all I'm looking for. Yeah, Everybody needs that, whether it's uh, music or art or. Yeah, I don't whatever, right? have it. I don't have it. Hey, for now. Right. We're all working on it. Yeah. I, we have some shelves on the set. If we had like a piece of like pottery from Eric Mika, that would be <laughs> unbelievable. So once you get to the point where you're super comfortable with it, you're yeah. Just like, yeah, I made this for you guys. Making like anything but like a a penny tray or. <laughs> small soup a bowl. penny tray like i put my thumb in for like a minute and then i was good yeah so i'm sure it's i'm sure it's i'm sure it's more uh complicated well, i can make anything half decent there will be one on the show okay i love it i love it okay you're always playing saint mary's saturday by the way so we got to talk oh. about saint mary's uh this is at home this is at home this is the saint last home. home game against saint mary's they'll go to moraga later famously made the choke sign after a win against yep. the gales how do you feel about the St. Mary's rivalry and, and what, what consumed you in that moment years ago? Yeah. You know, I was a kid. There's no word <laughs> I, I was so mad. I remember I was just so mad because these fans, you know, it's a small gym when you, when you play there and 
you know, to me as, as a freshman, you don't know like the landscape of of the conference. You don't have like individual agendas against team. You know, I didn't I didn't realize that there was a rivalry. I didn't know they were historically a really good team. Like they were just a team that was making me mad. Like, like <laughs> I didn't know who they were. I didn't care who they were. I was just in a small gym and these two fans were yelling at me the whole game, you know, telling me that I was uh that I was overrated, I was a bust and and I, I remember being in foul trouble. And so they kept doing the choking sign to me. These were like two guys in the in the student section. They're like, you're choking. You suck. And it was the two students in the student section. There were, yeah, there were two students, these two yeah. guys. Yeah. And they, they were yelling at me the whole game. And, I, you know, I was staring at them the whole game, just fuming because I was on the bench. I, I had foul trouble. And, and we were down big. And, and they kept doing the sign to me. And like I said, I was young. I was just a kid. I, and, and definitely let the emotions get the best of me in that moment but we had a sweet comeback and i gotta hit him with the choke sign it just had to be on espn uh, <laughs> there were a few moments like that for you <laughs> uh and, and i think you know i think i got caught on camera doing a couple of things that year you know talking to the crowd and saying things i shouldn't have said and at, at a certain point i don't know if it was after this game or after st mary's at home when two guys got ejected at least one one for hitting me in the face I think Coach Rose, we were watching film, and Coach Rose just like, Eric, I don't know what you're doing, but you got to just take it easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, you always have something to say. He's like, I can't even defend you anymore. You got to you gotta start cleaning it up, stop fighting everybody out there. Um, but, yeah, awesome game, great rivalry. You know, that first year I went 2-0 and against them, and then my last year at BYU, uh, they sent me out with an 0-3, even though we we had split with Gonzaga, you know, so – so very good team. I think I, last I saw they were ranked 22. I don't know if they've moved yeah. up since then. but Yeah, the, um, well, they're 22, but they're like top 10 in net and defensive yeah. efficiency. Like they are underrated. They are. Yeah, they're just like, yeah, exactly. It, it's those like, it's just that system, you know, Randy Bennett knows what he's doing. Um, they're like a well-oiled machine. So even when they're not, not good, you know, they're down years, they're still like a, a really solid team. Um, that might just be, uh, you know, developing or getting used to one another a little bit young, whatever it is. But um, yeah, it's a big one. And, and I know we we let that Gonzaga game slip at home. So, you know, I hope I hope we can pull it off on Saturday. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. And now we turn our attention to one of the many Cougars in the NFL making waves. He is back for the official offseason and rehabbing an ankle after surgery. Brady Christensen of the Carolina Panthers Yo. is back on BYU Sports Nation. Brady, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's good to be back. Okay, so while you rehab an ankle and you're in the off season, what do you do to pass your time? You watching soap operas? Is it the soap price opera. Price is Right? Game shows? What's going on, man? You know, I'm kind of rerunning. Uh, I love reality TV shows like Survivor, Amazing Race. You know, just replay seasons kind of over and over again. That's kind of what I've been doing. <laughs> uh, watching, you know, some Netflix shows with my wife at night, but mostly just kind of hanging out with my son, letting him climb all over me. You know, wrestling. It's it's been a good time. You know, I get to spend a lot of time with them, which in the season you don't have as much. So it's been awesome. Listen, you deserve a break because uh, you just finished year two in the league, and uh, I was looking up, uh, you know, snaps like 695 snaps, 533 pass plays, only two sacks allowed. Are you proud of that uh, number, only two sacks allowed, or is zero the only acceptable number there? <laughs> <laughs> zero is the only acceptable number. You know, I always say before the game, I always talk to the quarterbacks. They, they, they sometimes they're talking about sacks. I'm like, don't even mention the word sack. That's not, that's not <laughs> our vocabulary. So, you know, it, it was, it was an awesome season. You know, it was it, obviously first season uh, full guard. Um, start every game at left guard, and so that was good to settle down at guard and kind of have that transition. It was it was incredible season. Obviously, a lot of ups and downs with our coaches getting fired at the end of the season, but then to finish off our season like we did under our uh, next head coach, Coach Wilkes, it was it was incredible. 
Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, so I'm glad you brought up the changes. You had a few at quarterback and, of course, with the staff. How did that impact your season with the Panthers? Yeah, it, it was tough, you know, like your head coach gets fired. That's not an easy day. And then uh, basically like the next day they trade Christian McCaffrey. So one of your good friends, you know, is just gone out of there. Um, super happy for him. I hope he keeps going and just killing it. But, yeah, that was challenging. Um, we had a, the, the one saving grace. We had a super close O-line, and our O-line coach was incredible. And so – we just kind of rallied together up front and just really stayed close as a group. And I think as a whole team, we came together uh, through those hard times and, and, and had a great run at it towards the end. And you're only, you know, one game off the pace uh, in, in the division. You know, a, a losing record is going to win it from somebody. It happened to be the Bucks. What was this year like um, in, in contending for uh, a division title? Because you can't control what everyone else is doing. You can just try and win that title yourself. Yeah, it was, you know, we played a meaningful game in January, which it was incredible. We didn't have that last year. You know, each game in December was huge for us, and we knew we were right in it, uh, in the thick of things. And so it was fun to play those meaningful games and have those meaningful snaps. You know, hopefully next year we really just build upon that. And, you know, we're playing games into Jan January and February because that's, that's what it's all about is playing the playoff games. I just watch those games. I'm like, man, I want to be out there. So, so it's good, you know, stepping stone. We just got to kind of let it propel ourselves in, into next season. Well, speaking of next season, you are trying to rehab that ankle. How are you feeling right now? And what does the next few months and, and uh, the rehab course look like for you? Yeah, uh, feeling good. Um, had surgery last Tuesday. So I basically had a high ankle sprain and then uh, fractured the fibula too. So they had to put mm. some screws in there and then do a couple of things with the high ankle sprain. Um, but feeling good. It's been a week since then. Uh, just kind of rehabbing. I'm off my feet right now, you know. Um, can't really walk for, you know, anywhere from two to four weeks. And then kind of go from there, ramp it up. And hopefully I'll be really ramping it up by, you know, three months from now and really try and get back into it. So I think by fall camp, I'm, I should be ready to go and, you know, have the strength back and and start my third year, um, you know, very healthy. That's the, that's the goal. Is that gnarly? You can't walk for two to four weeks? Yeah, it's gnarly. I have this scooter that I just scoot around. <laughs> that my son has a little scooter, too, so we're just scooter buddies. We just <laughs> <we're everywhere. laughs> so that's awesome. Brady Christensen, one of the scooter buddies with us on BYU Sports Nation. I, I love that. Uh, how does this... <laughs> How does this impact your golf game, Brady? I know you're a big golfer. It's tough, you know. Like you, you lose so much of your golf in season. Now that I don't really get an off season, I think my game's gonna go. You know, I might just have to focus on the short game, get get the putting going. <laughs> going. Uh, but my long game isn't great either. So I, I don't know. Just, just <laughs> it's bad. That's that's all it is. <laughs> This year was especially fun watching Cougars in the NFL. Like yourself, as you started, like you mentioned, all, uh, all the games that left guard this year. And we saw, for the first time, not one, but 2,000-yard rushes. We never had one incredible rookie year from Tyler Algier. Jamal Williams, of course, leads the NFL in rushing. Uh, touchdowns. Uh, Fred Warner's crushing it. Andy Reid's doing his thing, of course, and many, many others. What, what's it like to see uh, sort of this uh, upward trajectory of Cougars in the NFL, not just being there, but having an impact on uh, some notable teams? Yeah, it's been awesome. I mean, we had the opportunity to play Tyler Algier twice. And so to be able to watch him up close again, he's an incredible player. The thing about him, too, is what's so amazing is obviously he's an incredible rusher, but he does the, the little things so well. He's such a great like pass blocker, and, and he gets out on screen so well. Um, it was really fun to watch him play this year. And then, yeah, we played Jamal, too, and Jamal had a career year. That was incredible to play him. And Taysom, obviously, doing his thing. You saw Fred, you know, playing basically DB against one of the best receivers in the league. <laughs> Amazing. <elite. laughs> incredible. Just incredible to see what those guys are doing. So it, it's been it's been fun to have, like, to play so many guys. And, you know, we always talk after the game, and, and it's 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 been fun. Now, we feel BYU's presence in the NFL. What do you feel about BYU's presence in the NFL, and how is it resonating among your teammates and, and other guys that you come across that are, are seeing you guys 
ascend from BYU. Yeah, I mean, basically, it almost felt like every game, you know, we were game planning against someone from BYU, you know, whether it be Fred or Sione the first game, you know, we had to be ready for him against the Browns. Like, even the defense, hey, be ready for Algier, you know, for these things. Like, all of a sudden, all these BYU names just kept popping up during game planning. And I'm like, every time I was like, go Cougs, you know, obviously you want to. <laughs> want to go win, but I'm just happy to see the success of other Cougs in the NFL. And there's going to be several more. I, I think we're going to look back to 2018 and 19 and those teams uh, that were young and you were cutting your teeth at 7-6, and six, and then obviously 2020 is a unique year and you guys explode on the scene. 2021 is amazing as well. That we're going to go, oh my gosh, look at all these dudes in the NFL from like that group. Um, and that's going to be Jaron Hall and Blake Freeland and Puka Nakua and, and others. What's your advice to these dudes generally uh, through this process next couple months and specifically for a guy like Blake, Blake Freeland and Harris Lachance to have, who have a legit shot at the NFL? Yeah, I think my one advice is to, you know, just trust yourself. It's so easy to play the game like, oh, am I going to get drafted? Where am I going to get drafted? Where are we going to live? You know, like, am I going to make a team? There's, there's so many unknowns and and – like so many ifs and it, it, that, that can kind of get the best of you. But my advice is just focus on one thing at a time, you know, whether it be combine or pro day, you know, focus on that, you know, be the best guy you can be for that day. And then if you have an interview, you know, be the best guy you can be for that day, really focus on just each event instead of looking at the big picture. And I think it will really, you know, help you stay focused on what's, what's really important. Brady Christensen with us on BYU Sports Nation. Brady, you were the first offensive line draft pick from BYU in a 15-year span. You had to go all the way back to Scott Young in 2005 until you were drafted. Now we're anticipating that Blake Freeland for sure is going to go. We thought that maybe Campbell Barrington was going to be, or Clark Clark and Campbell Barrington are both going to be there, but now they're at Baylor, so I mean – we feel like they'll eventually get there, but the point is, has BYU now entered the stage again where it is a pipeline of offensive linemen into the NFL? Yes, I'd love to see it, too, you know. Uh, and it's, it's crazy to think that I was the first guy um, drafted in 15 years, but really I got to give even credit before me. You know, you got Louis. Louis, if he was healthy, he would have been a first-round type of guy. You know, you got Tijon that made, made an NFL roster. You know, just like – those guys really started it and then just kind of kept it going. And there's so many guys on there that I, I look at. I'm like, those guys are NFL guys, you know. Even on this next year's O-line, you got like two or three NFL guys that you know about. And you know there's going to be other guys that pop up into the scene. So it's just incredible. That's what BYU should be. We should be getting all the best O-linemen, you know. You know, just big, strong, physical dudes because that's where it all starts. And so it's just like – I see those transfer transfers coming in too, and it's like BYU should be the O line school of Utah, and honestly, really of college football. I think it's a position BYU can recruit. Um, you don't have to yeah. go outside sort of the demo um, to find those guys, which is uh, exciting. You can get like a, a skinny kid from Bountiful and make him a third rounder. You know, like it, it happens. <laughs> um, yeah, King, yeah. Kingsley Suamata <laughs> is going to be the next guy. Uh, Connor Pay was the second highest yep. rated pass blocker in America. Perhaps he's another guy. We'll see. It's super exciting. Um, BYU in the Big 12. We, we've been talking about it. We're going to talk about it for a long time. We're wondering what kind of recruiting impact that's going to make. Walk us through sort of what you think as an athlete who was recruited by BYU but chosen independent, right? Uh, BYU as a Big 12 member, like how much better can the recruiting be given that BYU has access to a unique athlete already and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and others who want this situation. Yeah, I think if anything, obviously BYU should be the front runner for any, you know, LDS kid who's playing football, you know, I mean, you got the great opportunity to go to incredible school, so many great programs. And then football wise too, it's, it's top, it's top notch. I mean, even the past few years, I've said so many guys at the NFL, like, it, like it's, it's just everything about it is just top notch. So I think it's going to be incredible. And the football, I mean, playing in a P5 conference against Baylor and, you know, all those guys, it, it's going to be incredible to watch. And, and I think they really set 
up for a good first year. It's going to be tough for them, but, you know, they, they're starting to get the depth. They're getting the transfer portal, portal guys in, and, and it's just like they keep reloading every year. So it's been fun to watch. I'm excited to see them ball out and see the recruits keep falling in love with BYU and just keep coming. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. So better players equals better teams. Uh, it's not everything, but certainly something when it comes to uh, college football. Cougars have always been able to get a handful of really good three-star players. Uh, five stars are hard to get, but BYU has signed a couple in the past. They have one on the roster right now in Kingsley Suamatia. So four stars sort of becomes the pursuit in recruiting for BYU as they enter the Big 12. More of those guys. So, Shep, is BYU more likely to get more four-stars through high school recruiting or the transfer portal? This is really interesting. And obviously, the transfer portal is getting bigger and bigger, and it's becoming more prominent. And honestly, it, it, when it first started, it was more of a luxury. Now it's a necessity. It yep. has to be part of it. With that said, and first of all, let's go with the numbers. Let's go with what BYU, and, and let's look at this since 2016. So essentially since Kalani Satake became the head coach, what has BYU done in terms of four-star transfers and four-star high school recruits? Basically, and if you round up or round down, BYU is basically getting one of each. You're getting essentially one four-star transfer a year since 2016 and then one four-star signee per year. So right now, first off, before we even get to which one is better, you got to get more than that. Whether you actually yeah. believe in what the star system is, sure. because certainly every four-star is not going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. BYU has made quite a, uh, a living off of two and three stars. But you certainly want more because whether you believe in it or not, the talent, uh, talent evaluation of this player is considered higher than others, and you're going to bank on that. So I, I think for what the transfer portal is, most times you're probably looking at getting these guys for a year, maybe two. In theory, if you sign a four-star high school player, the hope is you're getting them for two, three, maybe even four. So I think BYU probably has a better chance of getting the guys out of high school this way than they are, and I think that's probably the better way to go because in theory you have them longer in your program, at least you, you hope you do. This is all gonna boil down to what BYU does in terms of wins and losses in the Big 12. That's why it's even more important mm -hmm. to get these four-star recruits and these four-star transfers in because your level of competition is going up and you're going to be facing teams that have a significant number of four-star recruits both out of high school and out of the transfer portal. So I, I think it's probably, the answer is probably out of high school and I think that's probably what you want because it helps build the foundation and they're there in the program longer. But you need both and that's all going to be predicated on how BYU does in terms of wins and losses. Yeah, a lot to unpack here. So first, um I, I agree with several things you're saying. I uh, disagree with a couple, but let's chat. So, one, the stars. It's hard, it's hard to like go all in and be like, this means everything. Sometimes it's off, whatever. Um, you know, BYU has, has made a living out of the following non-four stars. Tyler Algier, Blake Freeland, Brady Christian, Zach Wilson, Jaron Hall, Blake, uh, Clark Barrington. They've all come in as non-four star guys. They entered, uh, exited as four or five star guys. So it's not everything, but it's certainly something. So incoming players that BYU gained uh, that are four-star, according to 24-7, Eddie Heckard and Aiden Robbins. Um, incoming high school players, Jackson Bowers, Siale Acera, also four-star guys. That's great. Um, the average in the Kalani Stocky era, as you mentioned, 1.85, so about two, about one of each. Let's compare with Utah because Utah is in a place where BYU wants to get, which is winning a Power 5 conference championship. Let's be honest. They're, they're playing at a really high level, it'd be nice to see BYU do it quicker than 11 years, but I'd take it in 11 years as well. Utah is getting uh, 2.74 stars a year. Early on, it was minimal. In the last six years, it's 3.8. So they're getting four, basically double what BYU is getting at this point. And you think, well, what's the big deal? It's only two players. It's two players per year. It's two more players on the field that, that you sort of accrue here. Now, people do transfer. And, and ideally, like you said, hey, out of high school, you build the foundation. To me, it's like, the, the jar with the rocks and the sand analogy, the, the rocks would be the high school players and the sand would be the transfers. But you got to win now. And I, I actually think it's easier for BYU to get four stars out of the transfer portal than high school. I hope that it, it equals out a little more later. Yeah. But I think getting a kid in Slovis 
type guy out of high school is harder than getting Keaton Slovis as a transfer. I think some of these quarterbacks uh, and running backs, and whoever, they see that, oh, BYU is actually a spot for me where out of high school, maybe that wasn't the right time or fit. I, I think the transfer portal is BYU's best bet for getting the best possible players. Now, development is a huge part of what BYU does. We're sort of assuming, okay, if you get a four-star, they come in and they contribute. Isaiah Moa is going to be a star uh, for BYU. Got, got hurt um, you know, and, and barely played um, this year. It takes a second sometimes for these guys. A transfer plays immediately, Jason. That's why I almost, I almost uh, you know, sort of lean that way. But you need both, as you mentioned, because Isaiah Moa needs a year, year and a half, two years. Then he's going to be a baller. There's others who, unfortunately, uh, transferred out who are four-star kind of guys, like a Logan Fano and so on. You're going to lose some. You just hope that you net gain yes. on the positive side of that. Interesting. More on that a little bit later on in the show, too, by the way. <laughs> yes, The Athletic. Not a fan <laughs> of uh, what happened with BYU. So let's, let, let's say BYU starts to get three to four, like gets to that Utah level. Which is a four significant stars a year. jump. That means you've got 12 to 16, you know, after three or four years on the field um, total. That means six to eight on each side of the ball when you're playing. You, you add to those these two- and three-star guys that develop for BYU. Like I mentioned, BYU has been excellent at developing non-four-star guys into NFL guys. Now you're talking about a team that can compete for a Big 12 title. And you do need a five-star in there occasionally. I don't care how it comes. Like It used to be like, hey, out of high school, da, da, da. You, you take Kingsley Sumatia from Oregon yeah. if you can get him. And BYU does an excellent job of maintaining relationships with people so that later, if they need a change of scenery, BYU's available. Think about that for Kingsley. Didn't get him out of high school. What if BYU had burned that bridge? Aiden Robbins, what if they had burned that yeah. bridge? Aiden, Aiden almost came here last year, by the way, but BYU signed Chris Brooks. So Aiden Robbins goes to UNLV. There are opportunities there, and the, and the kind of guy and guys that Kalani Stocky and his staff are make it so that people want to come here. Now BYU is going into the Big 12. We hope that recruiting takes an uptick. And what we're really talking about is that you add a, uh, like two more of these dudes, four stars. Again, the evaluations are not, only, not always perfect. Correct. But, uh, in fact, some of the high, most highly rated guys in BYU history in recruiting didn't even end up finishing here. Like Ben Olsen's number one, obviously, bounced to UCLA and so on and so forth. You go through like the top 15 and you're like, seven of these dudes did not even get to their junior year here. It just happens sometimes. But I'm excited about what we hope is adding one or two more of these guys a year, and I think that'd make a big difference because four stars always at least yes. start. Well, and look, you, you referenced what Utah has done in their progression since joining the Pac-12 and sort of where they are now. And right now they're sort of at the pinnacle of where they have been within the conference with obviously the back-to-back -back Rose Bowls. But if you look, the, the, the most – Four-star transfers that they've signed came back in 2021 when they had six. That is a crazy yeah. number to get in. This year, from a signee standpoint, it's their high of seven. So you look in 2022 and 2023, they basically signed more four-stars than they had transfer in as four-stars. So I think that sort of, at least in my mind, sort of backs up my argument that at the end of the day, if you win, which Utah has done its most winning recently, if you win, people are more prone to want to jump in earlier. Right now, the, the situation with transfers, you have one year to play. You're going to pick the best system. You're going to pick the best situation for you. When you so that's, that's where BYU is getting some of these guys now. If they can start winning consistently in the Big 12, I think you start to get these guys much quicker. Therefore, I think it probably happens more in the, in the normal high school recruiting circuit that you go through. I think that's, that's the hope, at least. Maybe right now it's got to be the transfer portal the most yes. because you need to win yes. to then get more incoming yes, freshmen like correct. a Jackson Bowers and a Cialia yep. Serra uh, and others, right? BYU is going to recruit better. It's just how much better and how quickly will these guys have an impact because uh, – it's hard to make a massive impact as a freshman in college football, but we expect a couple of those guys that I just mentioned to be uh, massive contributors this year. We'll, we'll see what that looks like exactly, but kind of as backups, Jackson Bowers, four-star, top 300 guy ESPN. Can he come in and be the number two uh, to Isaac Rex? We'll see. When it comes to basketball in this conversation, by the way, it's really interesting because BYU is all in on the transfer portal uh, in men's hoops. 
and you got to win now. You can't, uh, you can't, you can't miss. Um, B- BYU's three transfers that they brought in have all shined in different ways throughout the season, but the consistency of that group, it's been tough. And you're hoping that, okay, I, I called it a long time ago, and Dallin Hall's going through it. Uh, leaning on a return missionary the year after they get back, there's going to be a lull there that just always happens. And unfortunately, Dallin's in the middle of it. Hopefully he comes out of it Saturday night. Um, struggled a little bit recently. And it happens with every player. But with a return missionary, it's just tough. Two years off. We know what that's like. But it, it's interesting in basketball that they are way more in on the transfer portal in this regard. They are also trying to get the incoming yes. freshman. I'm saying, not saying they're ignoring that piece. But to win now in college basketball, the transfer portal is a bigger deal in hoops. And you can't miss on that. Like, Whatever BYU does going into next year, which there will be overhaul. I'm, you know, every year it feels like half the roster is gone, even though there's only two people that will run out of eligibility in Rudy Williams and Gideon George. I'm interested to see what hoops looks like next year because you have to hit in the portal. Well, look, and the, the other part about this, whether it's high school recruits, whether it's transfer portal, and again, whether you believe in four stars or you put a whole lot of stock in, in the rating itself, other people do, and by other people, I'm t- I mean other programs certainly do because there's rankings that come out of it. Why, why wouldn't and, you, by and, the way? And players care about it. Yeah. There is a mystique. If, you, if there's somebody that's recruiting you and you look at all the four stars that are on their roster currently, that's, that's like, oh, all this other talent sees, sees something in them. Maybe I should too. It can be a deterrent sometimes where you sometimes. might be like, oh, oh there's too many. I can't play. Quarter, especially a quarterback. But, but I think that there is, there is something, whether you believe in it or not, the fact that if you can get a lot of them, it does prop up your program. It does nationally. Better players. Recognition. Better you teams. get recognition for it. Yeah, BYU's got to stop being in the 70s in, in uh, recruiting ranks. They need to get in the top 50. And that's not saying a lot. Top 50? Yeah. Come on. Can you be better than Fresno State or whatever? Let's go. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear are what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back. Jerem Jordan alongside Jason Shepard on this BYU Sports Nation. John Beck seems to be connected with uh, about everyone these days. He's worked with Jaron Hall and Keaton Slovis and Zach Wilson and many others in the NFL and college. Those are just three of the topics he addressed uh, with us yesterday as we chatted with the professional quarterback coach on the program. John, let's uh, go ahead and start with Jaron Hall here and his NFL draft stock. It's one of the bigger mysteries for BYU fans. We're all kind of wondering... Is he going to go on day two, or is he going to slide into the later rounds? Where do you see his draft value right now and, and the round that you, that you are projecting him to go in? It's tough because, you know, I think uh, every team has their own view. I talk to some teams, and they view him as like an absolute middle-round guy with the, pen, with the potential to how the senior bowl, the combine, and all of that goes, the potential that maybe he can move up. Um, I've talked to some other teams that are saying, look, like, Everybody's going to have a very safe uh, evaluation of, of him in the beginning. Uh, and so, like, let's talk about, like, the floor of where do we see is the last possible round that's Jaron going. So it's just tough because you hear, you know, anywhere from could he jump up into that, like, top of day two? Or is he going to be, like, somewhere in those middle rounds, right, hovering between day two, day three? It's just so hard to know because the truth of the matter is only scouting departments have done the work right now. The actual coaches have not started the evaluation process of guys. Uh, that, like, that's all happening right now. Kind of like these weeks are when everything kicks off of the coaches getting into it. Because there are some coaches right now that are trying to put staffs together. There are coaches interviewing for jobs. So until all of that settles, teams don't really start having their position coaches dive into the evaluation process. But look, I think it's safe to say Jaron's going to be drafted somewhere. Somebody's going to invest a pick into him which means they're going to have time into him. And then the biggest thing is just going to be that whoever does choose him, there's consistency, he gets time to develop because that's what quarterbacks need. You've uh, worked with Jaron for a few years now and known him for a while. What do you see as some of his greatest strengths as a quarterback right now, and where are you still working with him in some areas? You know, poise is a big thing for Jaron. Uh, he demonstrates it all the time in every game, no matter the circumstance. I think that's one of the biggest things that coaches – are going to really like about him. Obviously, it's the easy things to see as well. The athleticism, uh, the command of the offense. They're going to love his decision-making. They love that he doesn't put his team in bad situations very often. He can get out of things with his legs and make plays 
when nothing's there. All of those things are going to be really valuable. The thing that I'm excited about is when he gets to sit down in these interview processes with teams. Being a young man that's a return missionary that's mature like he is, he's going to absolutely knock it out of the park in these interview processes. And so that, to me, is where I think some teams, there may be a team that just says, look, we're not going to wait for a later round. Let's go grab him. We're talking with John Beck, uh, who is a quarterback whisperer. He might not call himself that. We call him the quarterback whisperer. Has certainly worked (laughs) with Jaron Hall. John, what's the best situation you know, we asked you to pick around, and as you said, it's tough. What's the best situation in the NFL that you could put together for a player like Jaron Hall? Sorry, I, I, I'm having tr- this dang camera. Sorry, guys, if you see me cutting out, Ben already gave me the heads up, and for whatever reason, I'm juggling the camera. I'm just going to be honest. So I, I apologize to anybody watching. Okay, say the question again. I'm so sorry. As you were talking, I was like, this dang camera. <laughs> no, all, all good. Okay. What's the best situation in the NFL for a quarterback and a player like Jaron Hall? Okay, it's, well, the best one is, well, look what the 49ers are getting right now. That's the absolute best situation you could have as a young player. But I think it's some of the things that I described, right? It's the, it's the consistency. It's they're picking Jaron because of who he is. It's not like, let's go get this guy and turn him into something else. It's we recognize his skills and abilities and we know what he can become. Now let's give him the reps in practice. Let's let's involve him in the offense in a way that's going to play to his strengths. And when he gets reps in the preseason, they're doing things that he's comfortable with. Sometimes what hurts a quarterback is when the offense that he's running in a pro system is so different from the offense that he ran in college. And then he's stepping out in those learning environments, and it's all new to him. Do this, some of the things that he's comfortable with. Let him build on the things that are new to him, but it not be just this major rush because to me it's, He needs positive experiences. He needs good things to happen. That's why you see a young quarterback like Brock Purdy. He gets kind of thrust into the position on a good football team. He has positive experiences, and his confidence continues to grow. That, to me, is what quarterbacks need early in this league to develop because there's going to be challenges. You have to learn. There's going to be bumps. But can you have the positive experiences along the way that keep you building in the right direction? Sometimes too many giant hurdles can be really hard on a young quarterback in the NFL. Zach Wilson certainly had plenty of that with the Jets this year. What is he going through right now, in your opinion, and will he get a shot with the Jets next year still? And that's – I don't know all the answers to that situation, and I think that Zach, as well as a lot of the people, are trying to figure that out right now. Um, I know that there's people in the building that still believe in Zach, that have believed in him the entire time. I know there's people in the building that would have probably liked to have done some things differently this year because of just how it played out. Um, And that's the really tough part about the NFL. Unfortunately, a lot of guys experience some difficult situations in the league. Um, And I was crossing my fingers, hoping that when Zach entered the league, that those type of things wouldn't happen. Um, And even when I finished the season with the staff uh, a year ago, uh, I would have never guessed that this is the way that it was going to play out. Things were trending upward then. But, uh, you know, you got to take the situation for how it is. What happened, happened. I think the biggest thing on Zach's plate right now is him focusing on just getting back to what he knows is his best playing ability, focusing on those things. And then whatever happens, happens. It's out of his control. I do believe there are people in the building that still believe in Zach. I'm sure they're going to have to make some decisions on what they do at the quarterback position if they bring somebody in. And then, you know, Zach's just going to have to compete. He's just going to have to continue to work hard. Those are things that he's really good at. So I have a lot of confidence in him. When you uh, are are assessing a Zach Wilson scenario and you're remembering what you went through with the Miami Dolphins, is it, in Jaron Hall's best interest to go to a place where he can be a backup? Is that, is that what we should, we, should, we should be hoping for? Well, I think it all depends on the situation. Um, better situations allow a younger quarterback opportunities to do better, have less on your plate. Like the, like the mistakes you make don't hurt the team as much. What can be difficult is when the situation is a tough one and your mistakes are compounded by the situation you land in. So, Is it beneficial to sit? I do believe there are good things that can happen from sitting and watching a veteran quarterback when things are going good. Um, I was in a situation that I got to watch a veteran quarterback for only a few weeks, and then he got injured. And then another person came in, and I don't think we'd won a game in the first 10 games. I think we were 0-9 or 0-10 when I got my first start. So it's just tough. Uh, Sometimes sitting can be good. Sometimes sitting, I don't know how much you gain from it because the offense may be reeling and struggling the whole time. You know, I know that when I got into the league, they said they felt like the best situation was the Phillip Rivers, Aaron Rodgers situations. And that's what they were trying to replicate. Could that have benefited Zach? Absolutely. I think it would have benefited him a lot to sit in that first situation and watch for a while. He probably would have gotten on the field eventually just because of how high of a pick that he was. But for somebody like Jaron, I think it all depends on the situation. Can the team that he goes to 
be sustainable enough where let's say he is picked in a, you know, a high middle round. Let's say he goes in the third round. Sometimes those third round picks, if things aren't going good, like they find their way on the field. I think this year was a record number of quarterbacks that took snaps in the NFL. Wow. Uh, I want to say like, I can't remember if someone told me it was like 60 something quarterbacks or maybe even more took snaps in the NFL this year. Well, if that follows suit next year and you're a third round pick, fourth round pick, you're probably playing in some games. So it's just tough because if you're on a good team, good things can happen for a young player. If you're on a, a bad situation, it's really hard to have good things happen. The last pick in the draft is pl still playing uh, in Brock Purdy. And I think if Zach Wilson had somehow slid to three in the Niners, I feel like that timeline in the multiverse is very different than the one that we've seen uh, this season. But I did want to ask you about Keaton Slovis. You've been coaching him uh, for, I think, a couple of years now. What's the relationship like? And uh, walk us through sort of the story of helping get him to BYU. You know, I'm really excited for Keaton and his opportunity at BYU. He's been a, a great kid, hard worker the whole time I've known him. Going back to when he was at USC, he started training with us. Um, when he went out to Pitt, same thing. To me, it was... Uh, seeing the talent that, I, that Keaton has talents. Is, I mean, sorry, Keaton's a super talented kid. Uh, and you know, for him, he wants to be able to finish a college career in the right way, knowing the way that he started college football and how he just kind of burst onto the scene and had a great year. He really wants to finish it off the right way. And the conversations were about, Hey, I think I'm going to be leaving Pitt. I think I'm going to enter transfer portal. Let's start talking about some possible destinations. And, you know, I knew that there was a potential of Jaron leaving early, going to the NFL. I think BYU is a great system, a great fit. I know the guys there really well. I know A-Rod and what he wants to do at the quarterback position, um, the efficiency and the statistics and all of that that can happen. So it was just, it, it was a conversation. Hey, Keaton, what about BYU? You know, would you be interested in BYU? And he showed an interest from the get-go. Uh, and then things just were able to kind of materialize. And I would get a chance to talk to A-Rod. Uh, I would talk to Keaton. That went back and forth for a number of weeks, and it worked out perfect so that when he entered the transfer portal, BYU got to be the first school talking to him. And I know Keaton's really excited, as am I, and there are a lot of people on both sides that I think were super excited for it to work out the way that it did. And, you know, I've been talking to guys. I know he's already in the indoor facility throwing balls with guys. I see some pictures online. He's smiling with the guys on the team. He's got roommates that are on the football team. You know, he sent me a few pictures of himself on campus, so I know he's excited. And to me, it's just all about now the work that he can put in from right now in January to when the season starts, the chemistry that he can build with the guys. And then I'm also super excited to see what the Big 12 schedule is going to be like and who we face. And I, I know that that was a big thing for him as well, the excitement of, you know, being to be the quarterback for when BYU enters the Big 12. Former BYU and NFL quarterback John Beck is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Let's talk about some of that work that Keaton Slovis is going to engage in. Right now, what does he do best? And what is area of concern number one that he needs to shore up? Um, Keaton's a very, very accurate thrower. I love the base that he plays with, uh, the way that he sees the field. He's going to pick up the offense quickly. Um, but the thing that's going to stand out and why NFL scouts are already talking about him, why he already had a senior bowl invite, he could have come out this year, is because the accuracy and the base that he plays with and how he can drive balls to those middle-level throws really well. So it's a lot of the things that he demonstrated early in college. He's actually worked really hard at improving on some downfield throws. So to me, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised to see what a healthy Keaton Slovis arm looks like. Um, you know, last year, a lot of guys don't know the injuries that he was playing with last year. He took a couple shots and he had a back injury, but he kind of played through it without a lot of people knowing. Um, so to me, it's going to be healthy. So what I want to work on most with Keaton is now that we have the healthiest Keaton that we have, let's improve on all the areas where you can be just extremely efficient. And then the area of like, OK, what does he got to work on most? It's the offense. Because guys like Jaron, we got to watch Jaron Hall play these last couple seasons. He was at BYU for a number of years in that same system before he became the starter. So there's going to be kind of this bar that's going to be set by guys that have been in the system. Keaton hasn't been in the system before. So it's going to be taking the knowledge that he has of plays that he's ran other places, how that can relate to what BYU does, and how quickly he can pick up the offense and gain that chemistry with the guys. I think you answered my question, but I want to follow up just to make sure. Because I wanted to ask about 2019, he leads the country in completion percentage. BYU sees him in his first road start. It's this overtime game in Provo, this classic. Um, in the offseason, he calls, uh, you know, he's like, the fans were weird. They were super nice. We all laughed about it. Now he's at BYU. But I did want to ask, um, was, he, was he hurt the last couple of years? Because the stats certainly weren't the same as 2019. And, and or was there more to it? I know Mark Whipple leaving Pitt after Kenny Pickett uh, left was a big deal as well. 
What else was kind of missing the last three years from him statistically? Because those numbers didn't really pop, but we hope that 2019 Keaton is, is 2023 Keaton. Yeah, I mean, without going into too much detail, right, he had to battle through injuries, arm injuries uh, at USC that he tried to play through on the shortened season and the one after. Um, and then at Pitt, there was a lot of stuff that went into that. There was a lot of things during the kind of like the investigating the school, talking to them about transferring, the offense that they kind of showed that they wanted to run, and then what was actually happening at the school. And look, Keaton's such a good kid. He's not going to say anything or throw anybody under the bus. But, you know, in some of our conversations, there was just this is not what the anticipated offense was going to look like. And then because of a player exiting that he was anticipating to be there that then transferred to USC, the school that he just came from, that was a big hit to their offensive game plan. Yeah. Keaton endured some back injuries that he had to play through. So it was kind of like personnel, the style that the offense was supposed to be, what actually ended up happening because of other injuries to himself and other players kind of what they weren't and were able to do during the season, all of that played into the way things played out at Pitt. And for, like, he's not at all, you know, doesn't look at like that was a bad decision at all. He's grateful for the time that he spent there. He enjoyed his teammates, but he was ready to kind of move to a place that, I, that he felt like was going to give him an opportunity to finish his college career the way that he wanted based off of how it started. And that's why I felt like when I threw out, uh, hey, what about BYU? It's because I think that that's the place that he can do it. And I'm really excited for that. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Tomorrow marks the end of an era, the final home game with St. Mary's as BYU is a member of the West Coast Conference. It's a big one for those reasons. The Gales are ranked in the Marriott Center for the first time in five years, ranked seventh in Ken Palm, sixth in net. Owen BYU has a two-game losing streak after last week. So, Dave, how does BYU beat St. Mary's tomorrow? Turnovers. Limit them. That's how they've lost all of their games. BYU has 362 turnovers on the season. That's more than a hundred. That's a hundred more than St. Mary's. That's the difference between first place mm. and, and where BYU's at. Because when you think of a turnover, you think of a possession. Yep. Even this last road trip, BYU went through and they lost to San Francisco and they, they lose to Santa Clara. And they gave those teams a combined, I believe it is, 34 extra possessions. In games they could have won, but they said, by the way, we're going to try to beat you today. And we're going to give you the ball 34 extra times. How do you beat a team like that? You don't. Uh, even in the Gonzaga game, uh, had one more turnover than Gonzaga, but they lost by one point. Trim the turnovers, you win games. So I think against a team that's as defensively minded as St. Mary's, BYU has got to protect the basketball. What do you think? Yeah, I think that plays into it. And BYU's 340th in the country, bottom 25. 22% of possessions BYU's turning it over. Are you kidding me? One out of every four? That's way too much. Somehow, you've got to get to 70. Because under Mark Pope, BYU is 75 and 19 when scoring 70 plus, 17 and 16 when scoring sub 70. But getting to 60 is even hard on the St. Mary's team. They allow 57 a game, fifth in the country. Certainly the way they play the game, which is a deliberate offense. Some say slow. I would say deliberate. They're hunting a great shot. They never take a bad shot, even at the end of the shot clock. Metrically, this is the greatest St. Mary's team ever, which is wild to think about. They've been to a Sweet 16. They had the Della Vidova, Jock Lando, Emmett Nar teams that were incredible. We'll talk to Alex Jensen coming up, uh, their play-by-play -play voice, and, and break this down. But they don't give it away. They have a nine-game win streak, fifth best in the country. Oh, by the way, the offense is 35th in efficiency. They are sixth in defensive efficiency. They do everything great. And they added the WCC Newcomer of the Year in Aiden Mahaney. He's this freshman from two miles away uh, from campus whose buddy is Randy Bennett's son who's on the team. He's probably always wanted to be a Gale. You're going to see him. He leads the team at 15 a game. Like, he looks like, um, you know, a freshman that would just be an American Heritage at BYU. Dude can shoot it. They rebound well, which BYU does as well. I think that's going to be important in this game. But that, that energy and that effort from the Gonzaga game against St. Mary's is going to be needed. It's always a different matchup. BYU matches up better with Gonzaga because they play similar styles. Nobody matches up really well outside of like 90s Princeton teams in Virginia with St. Mary's because they dictate the pace, they don't turn it over, and they shoot a high percentage. So this is BYU's toughest game of the season to this point. They have not played a team, one, like this, or two, as metrically high in net and Kim Palm as the Gales. 
Hopefully BYU can do what I meant. I said to somehow compete and or win this game. They've found a way to do it the last three times the Gales have come here. That's, that's four. That's four times. Three times under Mark Pope. Uh, what's maddening about the Cougars and, and what gives them a fighting chance tomorrow night is despite the turnovers, then you look at some of the other stats. They lead the league in uh, uh, their third in assists. They lead in steals. They lead in blocks. They're one and two in offensive and defensive rebounds over the course of the season. They're holding teams down. They play defense. They do these things, but they're number six in scoring because they give the ball away so mm -hmm. much. Limit that. Stick to what you do. You stay in the game because of all these things, rebounds and defense, and now you have a fighting chance. And that's why you see Mark Pope on the sideline of these losses, and he's, he's like beside himself or whatever. Yep. It's, he knows what he's dealing with. Yep. Um, but there's still enough good coming off his team. It's like you can't give up on these guys. They're in all these games. The only game they haven't been in was Utah Valley. One double-digit loss, yeah. which is wild. I, I think about two players that uh, I think BYU needs to have big games from. Spencer Johnson has scored three points in 49 minutes against St. Mary's. He's certainly capable of scoring 15 to 20 in this game. And then Rudy Williams is an enigma right now. Certainly last week had amazing performances, but they were in uh, – they, they, they were they – were, not completely garbage points, but like BYU was down by enough in these games to where it was like, well, just shot every time. there were catch-up points, if you will. Um, but against Creighton and Utah, and that's why I say the enigma, against Creighton and Utah, he really helped BYU win those games because off the bench, he scored 26 in consecutive Saturdays. So will quad one Rudy show up for BYU, and can Spencer Johnson be a difference maker? Certainly in the post against Mitchell Saxon, who is a talented post uh, for St. Mary's. Foose has got to have a good game. He's in a little bit of a lull. He scored yeah. 23 points the last three games. Dallin Hall is going through that post-mission freshman January lull that I mentioned could show up. Gideon George has been MIA for a month, it feels. BYU needs him. Yeah. BYU needs Jackson Robinson to make a couple of threes. Mm. I think BYU at home certainly is a different team than on the road. But this is, a, this, this is an opportunity here. And hopefully BYU understands what's at stake here is if you can somehow win this game, it really helps you down the stretch. Because what is BYU playing for at this point? Still hoping for the NIT. You'd have to have a nice run at the end of the season. You're also hoping to avoid a Thursday appearance in the WCC tournament for the first time ever. Not be a 7 through 10 seed. 6 or 7 seed is a very realistic situation for BYU potentially right yeah. now. And that's not how you want to go out in the WCC. You know what I'd do if I was the coach, and I'm not? I would start Rudy Williams over Dallin Hall. I, would I mentioned that, that this switch. week. Is now the time, Dave. Dallin's, Dallin's in this freshman wall type thing. BYU falls behind in every game now. And remember, against Gonzaga, they're down by eight. There were a couple of baskets from getting blown out early in that one. You get down by eight to St. Mary's early, that might be it. But there's been a pattern these last handful of games that we're going to fall behind, and then we're going to charge back. And how are we going to make it close? Rudy Williams is going to shoot all the shots down the stretch. Um, but I, we put the senior back in and say, hey, look, you know, Dallin Hall is the future of the point situation at BYU, no question. Maybe it'd be good now for him to sit back and watch a little bit uh, and, and kind of flip-flop roles that they started the season with. Rudy started, Dallin came in. Dallin was a little better controlling the ball, running the offense. You know what? I'd, I'd switch him back. Yeah, I, earlier this That's week I, I said I think now's the time to consider that. So we'll see if BYU does that coming up tomorrow. Are we sad to see St. Mary's go away? BYU will wrap up the WCC. This is going to be the last time we will ever see the Gales at the Marriott Center. Randy Bennett doesn't like to leave his own house, <laughs> let alone bring his team to the Marriott Center uh, for a tough road game. So this is going to be it tomorrow night. Are you sad to see it go? No, I'm, I'm not that sad to see it go. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the vitriol. I've, en I've enjoyed the, the sports hate, not actual hate, as I talked about yesterday on the show. No, because BYU has been building a new house. We're waiting for the construction to be done. We're excited about the uh, quartz uh, countertops and the cabinets and the, in the Big 12. It's going to be an upgrade from a house. Certainly, it's more in a more expensive neighborhood. The mortgage is more expensive. But new neighbors, new situation. I think BYU is ready for this. Um, it's been awesome to get to know Gonzaga and St. Mary's in this way. Other schools in the league, maybe not so much. Um, there have been moments that are like, what, what was that from BYU and different sports? WCC has been awesome. No disrespect to any, any, anybody in that regard. It was a place that BYU needed to be. Yeah. We did not expect BYU to have its main rival as St. Mary's. This has turned into something with Waldo throwing his mouthpiece and the Della of a dagger and the choke sign from Eric Mika and so on and so forth. 
competitive games where both teams are bubblicious type programs with really good coaches in, in Randy Bennett and Mark Few and Dave Rose and Mark Pope now. It's been fun. But I am too excited about the new neighborhood. I'm too excited about Baylor, Kansas, Houston, Kansas State, who's actually the best team in the league right now in the Big 12. Even Texas Tech, who's 0-7 in the league coming into the week. I'm excited about that game because that team's been to a Final Four in the last six years. So no, but I will have uh, you know, some good memories from this situation. BYU lost a lot of momentum when they left the Mountain West Conference. Uh, they were a contender in that league. Uh, year in and year out, and that league had grown to be highly competitive uh, with the clash with San Diego State even, even towards, uh, and towards the end. They lost that momentum going into the WCC, and then they're up against one of the best programs in the country that they beat three times in Spokane. More than any team in the league has won in Spokane over the course of, the, of BYU's history in the league. But outside of Gonzaga, and the only reason Gonzaga was big is because they're number one or number two. If we were playing an unranked Gonzaga team every year, I don't think we'd care much about that one either. No, it's because they were competitively good. And it was like yeah. we had to be at our best to even play with them. Yes. St. And Mary's? I think they elevated because of BYU in oh, the yeah. league. Yeah. They're, they're, they should be credited, number one. But I think Jim or Fredette scared the crap out of Gonzaga in Denver, where they go, yeah. oh, my gosh, they're going to start taking over this league. And so they elevated. Yeah, and, and then BYU hasn't been the same. Yeah. Had some great players, but yep. haven't had great teams, um, I, I, except for a year or two. But... But I think, uh, I think we won't miss St. Mary's for a single second. It was a fun game because it was competitive. There are more competitive games coming. Got a bunch of often. St. Mary's. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's been a fun game. That's it. It's not Wyoming, Colorado State, all those things that we had all those years of heated rivalries yeah. for a variety of reasons. So uh, let's enjoy tomorrow night, and then that'll be it. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Cougar Whip Round is presented by Marist, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. The Athletics' Justin Williams and Sam Kahn Jr. wrote up the uh, Big 12 winners and losers in the transfer portal. Here's what they had to say about the Cougars. Uh, the Cougars, this is a quote, the Cougars saw a ton of talent and production depart up and down the depth chart. Gone are both Barrington brothers and Holker on offense. The defense lost starting uh, cornerback Judy Lolly and linebacker Peely to Tennessee, Romney to Arizona State, and Fano to rival Utah. Splash additions, Slovis and Robbins should provide a notable offensive boost. BYU also replenished the trenches with Miley and Fitzgerald up front and Bagna and Cravens on the defensive side from Boise State, but all of them have large vacancies to fill. It wasn't a completely lopsided portal experience, but the losses stand out. Verdict, loser. What do you think about that? What's your reaction to uh, the transfer, being called a transfer portal loser? Don't like that. Uh, <laughs> used to being called that, but don't like that. Um, cer certainly, um, on paper, more talent left than came in, although a lot came in. Mm -hmm. But a lot went out. Um, and BYU, But again, there are other guys who we just don't know about yeah. quite yet. But it is hard to replace a Clark Barrington. Like, you're always not going to bring in someone who's better than Clark. But someone could develop to become as good as Clark, perhaps later. So that, I understand why they say that. I just don't like that particular vehicle. Yeah, when we had this discussion, and it was, I think it was Spencer and I that actually had this discussion a week or two ago, you know, it was the, the net positive, net negative. That's, I, that's, that's more friendly yes, phrasing. Yeah, like I, I, was ever, Loser. I was ever so net negatively at the time simply because of the offensive line. Well, since then, Miley has come in. I, look, it may sound like a cop-out, but I think it's more even than it is net positive or net negative at this point. I agree with The Athletic uh, that more went out than came in, but that's all right. A lot came in. Okay, speaking of The Athletic, Andy Staples tweeted the following. We examined some of the factors that got missed about Brock Purdy in an attempt to find the next later round gem of a quarterback. Of course, Brock, Mr. Irrelevant, winning with the Niners undefeated. He's the next big deal. Could it be Stetson Bennett, Max Duggan, Jake Hayner, or Jaron Hall? Mm. Could Jaron find himself in a conference championship game next season? Look, you never you know. imagine. Nobody thought Brock Purdy was going to, number one, they probably never thought he was going to play, let alone be on this winning streak and leading his team to a possible Super Bowl opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, is it possible? Sure. You just never know. It comes down to our conversation yesterday. If you go to the right place, it's the right fit, and you have an opportunity to play, 
you never know. The Seahawks are that team. Uh, just, just right there. No, Geno Smith set like franchise records in completion percentage and yards, and it was still a first round exit. The Niners were a quarterback away from being amazing. Yeah. They have a great defense, great skill position players. They added McCaffrey. That old line's really good. Man, and he's played great. It's not just like you just plug anybody in there. It's right. like, no, no, no. This guy was a capable, really good quarterback at Iowa State. Where Iowa State won the league in 2020, don't forget. And he's a, Iowa State! And he is a perfect fit for what Kyle Shanahan wants out of a quarterback. He does not Let's want... Let's go offense. Yes. Check it down. He wants a guy that's going... To, he doesn't need a flashy guy. Yeah, find George Kittle over the he's, middle. He's, he wants a guy that's going to follow the game plan, and that's what Purdy does. All right, our guy, uh, Big Game Boomer, released a list of the greatest NBA players of all time from every school. Obviously, Danny Ainge was listed for BYU. Who would you have second? Probably Sean Bradley, uh, second most games played, really tenured, obviously a gajillion blocks. Dunked on people, got dunked on, but he challenged, yeah. right? Probably Sean Bradley, although I was led to consider others. Because it's been a long time ago, we don't credit these people as much as they probably should be, but I want to with Mel Hutchins, second pick in the draft, four-time All-Star, Rookie of the Year. Only he and Wilt Chamberlain at the time, um, you know, back in the day had led in rebounding as rookies in the NBA. Jim Eakins played for over a decade, ABA, NBA as well, um, and averaged double figures for six of those. Those those two guys are in the mix when you look at all the numbers from NBA dudes from BYU. I agree. The answer is is probably Sean Bradley for a couple of different reasons. Number one, um, the the fact is high where he was drafted is how high he was drafted. Um, the other, and, and this obviously doesn't mean a whole lot, but in terms of earnings, he was in the league and signed some pretty hefty contracts. He was in the league. Sean's got to be the richest. Yes, Cougar from with the without NBA. question. Yep. Yes, absolutely. So I, I think what I think what Sean Bradley did. Look, when, when when the Nets were in town the other night to play the Jazz, they were talking about a record that Nick Claxton was about to break, held currently uh, by Sean Bradley. He had. 11 straight games with at least three blocks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, oh. yeah, the answer is probably Sean Bradley. Yeah. Um, and he was in Space Jam. Uh, both and Danny Ainge. Ball. And Danny Ainge. And don't you dare put those two in the same conversation. <laughs> the Jets have hired Nathaniel Hackett as the new offensive coordinator. Good hire for Zach Wilson? Um, yes, I actually do like this. Look, Nathaniel, why it's Nathaniel and not Nate, Nate or Nathan? Nate dog. Yeah. Nathaniel Hackett's issue was not... A, a, a coordinator problem. And I realized the Bronco offense was horrid, except when they played the Chiefs. I don't. It's weird. Uh, but his, he was he was not a head coach, is what the problem was. He's had success as an offensive coordinator. I like this. Uh, I like this a lot, as a matter of fact. And who knows if uh, if one Aaron Rodgers comes over, maybe Zach can learn behind a guy that's got his back. Robert Sala, <laughs> nice. Re, uh, Robert Sala mentioned that. No, this isn't a ploy to get any other quarterback. But if it happens. But uh, Andy Vasquez, who covers the Jets, uh, tweeted, Sala said he uh, talked to Hackett and told him we we're planning to bring in a veteran if we can while still continuing to work with Zach Wilson. So they didn't talk about specific names of veteran quarterbacks. That'd be the ideal thing. Mm -hmm. Bring in a veteran. It works out great. Uh, Zach can develop and get an opportunity, hopefully. Yes. We'll see. I don't necessarily trust that the Jets are actually going to give Zach another chance. Well, remember, LaFleur. I don't know if the fans want him to have LaFleur, the, his, his offensive coordinator he's had for the last two seasons, First time offensive coordinator. He had not had that. He was the quarterback's coach in, in San Francisco. Jets, first time OC. Uh, yeah. These were not yeah. good. Uh, you know, the, the soil wasn't super fertile there for Zach. But Zach's got to play better, too. Yes, I'm not 100%. saying it wasn't yep. Zach, like I talked about on yesterday's show. Sometimes you got to look at him. All right, friend of the program and extra points writer Matt Brown writes about a non denominational church hosting an autograph session with Notre Dame athletes after services sponsored by a local realtor. <laughs> is this something that BYU should look into? Like, I don't know, having lunch or after the linger longer, you know, sign some autographs? <laughs> I mean, come on. Is this, is this, is this a way to maybe <laughs> get the NIL going a little bit more? You fans will love this idea. You add to the tithing slip. It's like, there's like a new line. Fund, Book of Mormon, humanitarian aid, <laughs> BYU athletes. <laughs> No. no tithing funds go no. to athletics. None. Of course not. Um, yeah, that's interesting to, to have a church like the Utah Warriors rugby team actually signed like Chaz Ayu mm -hmm. and Jaron and Kingsley Suamatia last year. So it was like a team with another team. Why not a church? Uh, there's a church associated here. Look, you are not going to get me to speak ill of Linger Longers. My <laughs> wife and I had our first real conversation at a Linger Longer. Very nice. And here we are, four kids still later. still lingering. <laughs> yep. 
The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Good Whip Round is presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Here we go, Fred Warner. Not a finalist for NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Is this a snub? No. Uh, Nick Bosa, Michael Parsons, Chris Jones, incredible players. Fred's awesome. He's the best middle linebacker in football, but uh, no, not in that top three, top five, but certainly a, I think a top ten defender in the league. All good. Yeah, I think I'd give it to Micah Parsons. Incredible. Dominant this year. Playing with a club. <laughs> Just getting it done. Reminded me of Ossie Antonetti, men's volleyball. Like his sophomore or junior, left hand just wrapped up, just hitting the ball with a big club. I don't even know if that would be legal nowadays, but it was fun <laughs> to watch in the late 90s. Will this be the last Friday in which we don't know the Big 12 football schedule? You know, it's like Paul Revere's ride. You know, if he'd, if he'd taken that ride four or five times saying the British are coming, by the fifth time, people go, you know what? They'll be here when we see them. Uh, it's been kind of that way with the schedule, except everyone has said the end of January. Even Baylor's AD saying, saying Tuesday, which would be the 31st. Like everyone said something. Yeah, but no one said anything beyond next week. That's the, that's the caveat. I think it will come out Tuesday. So this should be the last weekend without the Big 12 schedule. More controversy with the Big 12 schedule or the fact that Paul Revere probably wouldn't have said the British are coming because he was British. The thing is, when he, <laughs> when he did ride, people listened to him. He's like, we are coming because we're all from this country. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, if it was his third ride through, people go, there goes Paul. <laughs> Paul keeps coming through. <laughs> crying wolf. So maybe the wolf will stop crying on Tuesday. Yeah, let's That'll just, be one of the biggest days in the history of the sports program. Let's, let's just, just get the schedule right. It'll schedule. be exciting. Lauren Gustin, another 20-20, 20, 20, 20 points, 20 rebounds last night. Nani Falatea with her third straight 20-point performance. Mm -hmm. Which is more impressive? I'm going 20-20, uh, mainly because uh, I think it is, and Lauren Gustin's on my fantasy basketball team, Nani's on uh, Spencer's. But <laughs> the fact that Nani has elevated her scoring is really big for this team as they aim for at least uh, three seed. Gonzaga and Portland and BYU feel like top three teams in the league. You want to be a three or a four seed. You want to be the three almost, too, so you can avoid probably Gonzaga uh, until the championship game. But this BYU team's getting better, which is exciting. They've won eight of nine. They're winning because of Nani's points. They're in games because of Lauren's rebounds. If she continues yeah, to get Lauren's putting up 20 22. Stuff, yeah, but, but this is an additional. Yeah. This is 45 points combined last night. That's pretty good. And that's how this team is, is yeah. putting it together. So both important. And, and Gustin's on track to beat Tina Gunn-Robinson's single-season rebound record in school history and on track to beat Bro Mel Hutchins' single-season rebound record. Two incredible players in BYU history. So we're we talking are, about we Mel could Hutchins be history. very well watching the best rebounder in the history of BYU. It's special. It really is. Speaking of special, BYU fan El Guapo on Twitter posted the following yesterday. Tom Homo was the model for the Sailor Cougar. Convinced me I'm wrong. To which Tom Homo replied, no, my mustache was thicker. What do you think, Dave? Is Tom Homo the model for the Sailor Coop? Uh, no, he's not. <laughs> it's not even close, right? But let me not enough wee scares. Let me tell you what Tom Homo is. He is the he is the backbone behind this BYU getting to the Big 12. He is the he is the guy that's taking him from here and taking him over here. Unlike any other administrator type in the history of the program. Uh, his mustache is awful. I'm glad he doesn't have one. <laughs> it was well-groomed. But where would BYU be today without Tom Homo as the athletic director? And so for that, he's the, the model for whatever BYU wants to be. Would BYU still be uh, in the Mountain West, question mark? I mean, Tom's taking BYU, like Brigham Young, Tom Homo's taking BYU into the yeah. wilderness and then eventually settled in, right? And he's had good people around him, but somebody's had to lead the way. Yep. And, uh, and he's been that the very, one of the most important figures in the history of BYU sports is Tom Homo. Absolutely. I'd go probably Lavelle 1, and then there's a real argument for Tom Homo too. No whip question here, but more of a news item of note. Greg Kite's home, broken into in Orlando, Florida. Among the things taken, his two Celtics championship rings. Uh, and we, we encourage everyone in Orlando to look yeah. for those. Uh, there was tens of thousands of dollars of, uh, of uh, jewelry taken from his home. The, his wife and kids showed up. The burglars were still in the house, and they ran out the back That's as scary. they came in. It, just a horrible, frightening situation. Greg said, fortunately, 
uh, everyone was okay, yeah. but he would sure love to get those rings back. If you're in the Orlando area and uh, you're at a pawn shop and you see a Celtics championship ring from, uh, you know, what was it, 84 or 86? Hey, get that back to, to our guy, Greg Kite, who joined us on the program last season, uh, coming into town to uh, join us on Alumni Day and celebrate yeah, that 81 awful. national title team. That's tough, man. That's tough. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear and catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.